<laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, good morning. Hopefully, this was designed to be um, kind of a natural progression from learning about 3D scanning and how to obtain models to now what do you do with the models. And so the two kind of techniques I'm going to talk about are 3D printing, where you can take that digital 3D model and create a physical copy of it, and augmented reality, um, where you can put, as already you've already seen this with the HoloLens, you can put the 3D model over the, the real world. So kind of an outline of how this, this section is going to go. I'm going to talk about what is 3D printing. I'm going to talk about how you can use it in your research and teaching. We're going to talk about how to 3D print. Um, I'm kind of hoping that this is both a kind of a broad overview, um, kind of get a bird's eye of what can you do with these technologies. But also, since this is, this is a workshop, I want to get into the weeds so that when you leave, if you don't have experience with these technologies, um, you'll know where to start and what software to use and where to go. Um, if you've already used the technologies, please you know, jump in. Always ask questions, um, but also share your own experiences um, if you use 3D printing or, or augmented reality. Um, after we talk about how to 3D print, we'll go into AR, um, talk about what uses, you know, especially here at UF, seeing in research and, and teaching. Um, and then we're going to do kind of a hands-on um, demo using Erasmo, which is now, as of a few months ago, called um, HP Reveal. So hopefully you've had a chance to install that on a, a smartphone or a tablet if you want to follow along. Um, otherwise, I think I figured out how to mirror my phone um, to the projection system so you can at least see what I'm seeing. Otherwise, AR is kind of boring. OK, what is 3D printing? Um, it is a form of additive manufacturing. So this is the concept that you can make physical models layer by layer by layer. Um, we're going to talk about a variety of technologies. And, and it uses a variety of materials. So it's not just the plastic, which is what you're going to see. Um, there's also metal and nylon and multi-rosin. And it seems like every month or two, there's new materials coming out that you can use in 3D. So here's a, here's a schematic that shows right now kind of the, the landscape of 3D printing. It's, it's really all over the place. We have sheet lamination, where you can actually make 3D models out of pieces of paper glued together, um, material extrusion, um, where you're heating up something and you're, you're squirting it out. Um, we have powder. Um, well, I'm going to go into these in a bit. But you can see that there's a large variety of different types of technology for making these, these 3D models. So the most common kind that you're going to see in magazines, you're going to see in TV, probably. Um, you might have one in your office. We have them in the library. Um, you can actually, down in Australia, they're selling them at Aldi's um, around Christmas time. So these are, they're known as FFF, Fused Filament Fabrication. Um, you might also call them, hear them called FDM, Fused Deposition Modeling. That's actually a trademark term by Stratasys. So we like to use FFF. Um, this is, the way the technology works is I would basically describe it as a robotic glue gun, where you have your, your spool of filament. I'll come over here to, this is one of our library printers. We have our spool, kind of thread. It goes in the printer. Goes down here, we have some cooling fans because it's going to get very hot right at the bottom of the nozzle. It gets to, this is printing at around 210 Celsius, so that's in the mid 400s for Fahrenheit. So it gets very hot, but you don't want, it, you don't want that heat creeping up the tube because then it clogs, so we have a bunch of, of fans right there to keep it cool. And then we have this build plate. And I'm going to try to start it. And this is a fairly slow process. All right, so I'm printing out, probably can't see it quite there, but it's a tiny octopus just for a demo. They tend to print really well. Um, we have blue painter's tape here on the bed. This is a cool bed. Um, some of the printers also have heated beds to um, facilitate adhesion. OK, as you can see, it's starting to heat up. And in a few minutes, um, it's going to kind of beep at us, and it's going to start printing. So we'll let that go for a bit. Um, another type of technology is stereolithography. And this is known as SLA. And the way it works is that you have, oh, 
is not the video. Um, you have a, whoop, a vat of liquid rosin, and you have a laser. And the laser shines up, and it cures the, the liquid rosin, um, and it pulls it out layer by layer by layer. And so, again, it is building up a 3D model. Um, it's similar in, you know, it's the same type of 3D model that you give the software, um, but of course it has, being made out of, of rosin, cured rosin, it has different material properties. Um, it tends to be very high resolution, so unlike the, the plastic FFF style printers, um, down here in the bottom you can see, this is an example, that I would say this is actually very badly printed, so not maybe perhaps the most accurate, but this would be an FFF style where you have kind of plastic strings that's coming out, and this would be an example from an SLA type of printer. Um, so SLA, they're very popular in museums for people who need to make uh, replicas of very small, very finely detailed objects. So people who are, are casting, say, miniatures for games, um, they like this type of, of 3D printer. Um, the most popular ones are, are made by Form Labs. They're up to the Form 2, I think. They might have the Form 3 out soon. And they run approximately $3,000. This is a really messy type of 3D process because you know, they've tried to make it fairly self-contained, but when you take out the model, it's dripping with rosin. You want to have a sink nearby. Um, so for those reasons, we don't have them in the library. <laughs> All right, another type of technology is known as SLS. Selective laser sintering. So this is where you have a powder, and it could be metallic, nylon, so different types of, of materials, but it's a powder base, and it uses a laser to, to, again, it's fairly slow, but you're sintering, you're hardening this powder layer by layer by layer, and you're building it up. Um, one of the, the major advantages of this technique is that this model is, is still encased in its powder, and the powder acts as support material. So supports, this is one of the limitations of 3D printing. Um, with this type of a printer, you know, it's laying out this layer of plastic, and it has to have a base to, to lay, out, lay out each layer on. Um, so imagine you're printing on a tree, and you have a branch. Without support material holding it up, the printer would shoot out a string of plastic and come back. Now, if it's a short distance, it might be okay, because the plastic does, does cool very quickly. Um, it hardens, I would say, almost, not quite instantaneously, but, but very close. Um, but you're still going to have some droop. And maybe the droop isn't so bad, so you can build the next layer and the next layer, and it's okay. But if it droops too much, or it just doesn't really um, you know, form that, that solid, solid branch, you know, it's going to fall, and your model is going to be worthless. Because um, there's really no way to recover at that point. And so the way we get around this with this type of printers is that we have support material. And that is, um, is made out of the same, the same type of plastic, um, but it's designed, it's kind of this waffly material that the software adds, and it builds up from the, the build plate upward. And so when it gets to that branch, there's already something there. It can build the branch. I'm having microphone trouble. And then you can remove it with, say, pliers. And so you can see the advantage of having something like this SLS, where you can just take an air gun and you can blow off the powder and you release this pristine model. That's a, a real advantage. All right, a different, yet yeah, a fourth type of 3D printing. Um, this is a polyjet. So in this, we, um, you have a, a liquid, liquid um, photopolymer, and it's, at the same time, it's, it's spraying out very minute particles of this liquid. Um, it has a laser, and it's, it's hardening it. And so, again, it's, it's doing the layers. So it's somewhat similar to the SLA, in that you have a liquid rosin, but here you're actually spraying it out, and you're hardening it at the same time. Um, these printers, they're very expensive, um, in the hundreds of thousands. But we do have some of them on campus that are, are use, accessible to the UF community. Um, and they're capable of printing multiple materials um, and multiple colors. And so if you're trying to create a replica, um, you know, and you, you want it to be, you know, to, to look as realistic as possible, rather than having to paint plastic, you know, this is a great solution for both high resolution 
and um, making, it, making it look accurate. So in the video, you can see it's, it's spraying out these, this liquid, and it's hardening it instantaneously, and it's building it up. These are very strong um, models, very high resolution, and very expensive. OK, so going back to our FFF style, a 3D printer. How many people have, have used 3D printing on campus? OK, that's great. That's a good number. Um, how many people have used something other than the FFF style? OK, so pretty much everyone's experience is with this type. Um, and that makes sense because th these are very affordable at these, this point. You know, I mentioned that they're selling them at Aldi's in Australia. Um, I saw one for sale. And I'm not saying it was a good 3D printer, but it, um, it was $187, which is getting very, you know, very inexpensive. Um, up to the ones that we have in the library, they're around $5,000. So that's, that's, I would say, kind of the range. If you get above $5,000, you're probably going to want to look at other types of technologies that are perhaps um, you know, faster or have higher resolution. But looking in the, in the price range, what, what we're discovering is that Spending more in printers, that doesn't necessarily get you a faster or a better, better printer. Um, what it probably does get you is that it's a larger build volume. Um, it, it might be more reliable, more accurate. So you know, it's, it was machined better. Um, you don't have to tinker with it so much. When you get down to the, the printers that cost several hundred dollars, they might be in kit form, so you're having to put them together yourself. Um, you probably start to learn your printer really well and replacing um, parts or upgrades. And so you know, you have your, your plug and play ones where you don't have to think about it versus the ones that you tinker. And so you have to think about you know, what are you willing to do. But we have had ones that are, well, actually, so these PrinterBot plays, these are around $300. And we are finding that, assuming it's all set up well and calibrated well, that the models look just as good as they do on our, our three to $5,000. 3D printers. They just take a little while to produce, and they're smaller. So talking about the filament in these type of printers, um, there's two major types, um, ABS and PLA. There's actually other types of, of filament now that are becoming um, more and more popular. There's PETG, there's HIPS, um, there's dissolvable filament, like PVA, polyvinyl alcohol, um, which if you think about um, you know, the need for support material, if you can have a printer that has dual extruders so that you have one type of material in one and your dissolvable support material in the other, then if you can dissolve support materials, you've taken away kind of one of the main, main issues with this type of, of technology where having to clean off the model um, becomes an issue. But going back to kind of the traditional two types, ABS versus PLA, um, everyone probably here is familiar with ABS because it's the plastic that's used in Legos. So it has, tends to have a glossy exterior. It's very strong. Um, it's also petroleum-based. Um, so when we talk about printers and we talk about emissions coming from the printer, um, being petroleum-based, it tends to produce fumes that are very noxious. Um, and unless you have extremely good ventilation, you know, ideally in a, <gasps> the base came off. Oh, drop. All right, I'm going to stop it because I don't want to debug this in front of you. OK. Printers also fail a lot, <laughs> especially when you're doing a live demo. Um, so, so talk about the noxious fumes. You know, emissions are an issue with 3D printing. Um, I recommend you know, always having um, adequate ventilation. I would say if it's ABS, you want to stay far away from it. PLA is. Um, it uh, stands for polylactic acid. This is derived from a plant starch, so people consider it green. Although, you know, it, so it, does, uh, it is biodegradable, although it's over many, many, many years. Um, it's also, fair, you know, the strength is, is fairly good. Maybe not quite as strong as ABS, but unless you're putting um, lots of stress and pressure, pressure on the models, you might not really um, need those properties. Um, it extrudes at a slightly lower temperature. So your printer can, you don't have maybe have to have quite such a high-end printer to do like you, you do for ABS. Um, 
You can sand both of them, but ABS has the ability to be dissolved in acetone. And people like that because you can create what's called an acetone vapor wash, um, where you can put your model, either you can dip it in acetone or you can put it in something where there's um, acetone fumes. And it tends to, what it'll do is it'll kind of, I'll use the word melt, but it'll, um, it'll soften the exterior of your model. And so, you know, instead of having a model with, you, you can see the lines, perhaps from the layers, now you have a, a glossy model that looks like, um, you know, it came from a, a mold ejection system. Um, PLA, you can't do that. It doesn't dissolve in, I'm, I know there's chemicals that it does dissolve in, but they're, they're not ones that you would have access to. Um, so you can sand it, you can paint it with an, you know, an epoxy, um, but so that's, that's kind of one trade-off. Um, the other thing about PLA is that you have to be aware of is that it does, because it extrudes at a lower, slightly lower temperature, um, at around like 100, 120 degrees Fahrenheit, it starts to soften. So, you know, for most applications, and that's not a big issue, but if, say, you're printing out something to hold your phone in your car in the hot Florida summers, that's an issue sometimes because it'll start to droop. So these are all properties that you have to think of um, when you're, you're 3D printing. So why would you, why do you want to, to print? What are, some, what are some reasons? You know, we hear the criticism about 3D printing is that it's only for producing trinkets. And, you know, obviously, we have some trinkets up here. Um, after this, you know, during lunch, I hope you have a chance to come up and look at the models. Um, but there are real, you know, academic teaching, research, real reasons to, to use 3D printing. And we'll kind of go through, I, I've categorized them into visualization, sharing, preservation, and then creation. So 3D printing is, is fabulous for, for visualizing, especially things that are, are difficult to, um, to comprehend other ways. So for example, um, Natasha Vidic, and she is, she's with the museum. She was a grad student here. I'm not sure if she's graduated at this point. This was several years ago. But she was creating lesson plans to help um, fourth graders understand um, the differences in scales of objects. And so she printed out um, a virus, um, tardigrades, which are you know minute um, lau lice, laus, um, and I'm not going to try to pronounce that. Um, and what she did is that, you know, especially with the virus, is that she printed it out at, at different scales until. You can see this, this upper one, that's actually, that's this virus, I think, multiplied by 1,000. Um, and she had to print it out in pieces because it was so large. But you know, she provided this to the, the class um, so they could, they could see the differences in scale and kind of get a sense of, of um, how small things actually are. Um, we're seeing it more and more in the medical fields, um, allowing surgeons to visualize, to even practice the surgery before they go and, and actually do it on, on people. Um, this was an interesting case. These were, um, this was back in 2016 in Houston, the Texas Children's Hospital. Um, this was a conjoined twins. And you can see, this is, they had a CT scan and they, they 3D printed the organs and the ribs. And you can see that this is a very, very complicated situation. Um, and of course, you know, this, this whole process took months of preparing for the surgery, um, but by, by printing it out, by actually seeing how things were, um, they were able to plan it out, and the surgery was a success. Um, now, you want to have, you want to make sure that your 3D printer is very accurate. Um, it's, you know, producing the prints as, as you know, at a, a high enough quality. Well, we were actually contacted. This was a couple years ago um, by the the vet school, and they were they had a 3D model of a tumor, and it was a dog and they were gonna do surgery in the next couple days, and they wanted to know if we could print it for them so that they could look at the tumor. And, you know, thinking about her, well, we have nicer printers than this, but, you know, I had to decline because, and send them over, I, I referred them to the Fab Lab, because I didn't want to take the chance that our 3D model just wouldn't quite be accurate, um, and they'd go to do surgery on these dogs. Um, but I think this is a, a really excellent application. Um, something else that we've been working on in the library is, and this is over several years, um, we've been printing out models for um, researchers in anesthesiology, and they are developing a training device 
And I've only seen pieces, so I haven't seen it in the full <laughs> all together. Um, but it's going to be a training device to allow simulation for giving injections through the rib cage. Um, so again, something that you want people to practice on before they actually do the real thing. I'm also you know, talking about concepts that are difficult to comprehend otherwise. Uh, mathematics, so you can print out functions. Um, here's a Klein bottle up there in blue. Um, this is a, a Golgi apparatus. So this was about seven layers, and this was printed out by um, a biology professor here at UF. And he wanted to be able to pass this out to his students so they could see how it all, all looked. And I have to say that that was a, quite a challenge to print. Um, he also wanted specific colors. Um, we've done, we've printed human proteins. So this was actually, when we started our service back in, this would have been early 2014. Um, this was one of our, our guinea pigs, um, he, uh, a researcher in, um, who, who is trying to understand how human proteins interact. And he thought that if he could hold them in his hands and you know, physically manipulate them and try to get them together, he, that would give him insight. And so you know, his whole research lab came to the library, and we all you know, watched our brand new printer you know, printing out these human proteins. Um, and they were so excited that he went back and he purchased his own 3D printer, and we really haven't seen him since. Although we've seen other people come from his department saying, you know, hey, Brian, send us over to you, and, you know, let's, and that's kind of the, the pathway to getting into 3D. Um, moving on beyond visualization, talking about preservation and sharing. And this is something I, I find really exciting because there's so many you know, fragile and rare things in the world that, you know, especially in research and, and teaching, that you want, you want to have access to, you want your students to be able to hold and experience um, but for whatever reason, they, you know, they won't be able to otherwise. And so now with, with 3D printing, um, if you can obtain the 3D model, you can print it out. Um, or you can you know, look at it digitally, um, and you can, you can see what it's like without having to, to go to the object or to acquire it. Um, many museums now are, are scanning in their specimens, their objects, and making them available. These are from... Um, the Sonian's um, X3D, I think, website. Um, so it's you know website. They're freely available. You can download some of the models, and you can. Not all of them are suitable for printing. Like obviously, Amelia Earhart's suit probably wouldn't do so well in the printer. Um, but you could try to print out the bust. On um, PaleoTeach.org, this is a NSF-funded project with the Florida Museum of Natural History, and I think it's a partnership with Duke University. And they 3D scanned um, a full set of megalodon teeth and also uh, paleo, um, paleolithic equine teeth. And what they, they did is they scanned it and they provided those models, um, both digitally and um, 3D printing. So there was a whole summer a couple years ago where you just printed out shark teeth. And I have one of those here. Of course, you know, kids see this and they instantly know what this is. And this is real size which you know, is, is pretty amazing. Um, and then along with these, these models, or the files, um, if they have access to a 3D printer, um, they came also within lesson plans. And so, you know, for example, with the equine teeth, students could measure you know, the size, they could look at um, you know, how the tooth, uh, the wear on the tooth, and by making different measurements, that would tell them about the, the climate at the time, because you could tell you know, what, were the, what were the horses eating. Um, you know, was it grass? Um, were they chewing on branches? Because that would have different wear on the teeth. And then that, once you know what, they're, what they were eating, that would give you a sense of, of what the vegetation was like, and that would tell you about um, the, the temperatures at the time. So it's, it's kind of a proxy. Um, so looking at how the, the climate has changed. Um, and then, of course, if you can make measurements on shark teeth, then it can tell you the age of the shark. Um, I know there's other things involved, but very popular. And actually, I was at um, Gainesville High School about a year or so ago, and they had one of the teeth there. And I went to the, you know, we printed that out. So I know that they're being used at um, all, you know, K through 12 schools, not only in Florida but also across the United States. Um, another, this was about maybe two years ago. How many people heard about this, the Homona Lady discovery? So a few. This was. Um, very exciting. Down deep in the, the base of a, a cavern, 
or a cave system in South Africa, um, they discovered just a, a large amount of fragments of, of bones, and, um, and it was very difficult to traverse. But they went in and they actually 3D scanned the entire site, so they have that preserved um, before they, they remove some of the fragments. Um, and then when they came out, actually in the field, they 3D scanned and they made these, these models available. Um, it's a website called Morphosource. And it's hosted by Duke, and you can go there after this, and you can download um, the scans. Some of them are in CT scans. Some of them have been converted to uh, the type of file format that you need for the 3D printer. Um, so we did this when they were available. This is a picture showing the printing in progress. So you can see that we had a lot of support material. Um, it's printing halfway. And then uh, one of my colleagues, um, Dan Rabusin, he's African Studies librarian, and he, um, he painted these. And that was kind of his first experience painting plastic models. Um, but he used, he went to, I think it was Joanne's, and acrylic paint and sponges, and um, they turned out, I would say, very, they look very realistic. Um, and so those have been you know, passing around. And, and as I understand, this isn't my field, but as I understand it, a lot of times there, you know, there's more researchers than there are our bones to actually analyze. And so for the first time, you know, this, these were made very quickly, publicly available, and the paper was also open access. And so it's a case where you're making, you know, these researchers decided that it was very important for the entire, basically the entire world, to have access to their research immediately, rather than holding on, kind of hoarding it, um, and making it difficult to access. And they've continued to release, you know, more 3D models. Um, and so it's, it's really quite something. Okay. And then moving into creating with 3D, which of course is what people you know, mostly think about with 3D printing. Um, this is a student organization called GRIP. This is at UF. And um, the library sponsored them over the last few years. And they, they design and 3D print prosthetics for um, children and teenagers with upper limb differences. Um, mostly they're, they're local youth, but they've also worked with, with children. Um, I know there was, there was a child in Arizona. They've also worked with a child down in, in South America. I forget exactly which country. Um, but they had these different projects, and it started off with 3D printing, kind of this basic hand. And it sort of works off puppetry, where you bend your wrist, and it curls the fingers. Um, and, and that was great and all, but then they, just, they realized after working closely with the children, and this is always in partnership with the child, the child gets to, you know, they talk about what they, they want their hand to look like, what color they want, what designs they want. Um, they realized that, you know, the five finger hand might not really be what a child wants. They might, and what they're moving towards is kind of a modular. So depending on the task that they're doing, they attach a different device and it lets them, um, Let's see, I don't have the picture here. This is one of their detachable ones. So there's the five hand, but there's also an attachment that lets, lets this boy um, kayak. Um, also, um, they have a marshmallow shooter. Um, they're developing all sorts of different, and that's driven by, by the child or the teenager. You know, I want to be able to do this. And then the undergrads here, they brainstorm how can they work? Um, how can they make this work? And it's, it's not just with the undergrads, they're not just engineering majors, there's also uh, majors coming from art, um, psychology, and so it's really an inter interdisciplinary um, group. And this year, um, they've actually doubled in size. Over 200 students attended the first meeting, and they have 10 different projects going on. Um, so it's a, really, it's a really exciting group. Um, here's another case, this was several years ago. Um, this is an undergrad, and he wanted to study how predators go after baby go gopher tortoises. And um, gopher tortoises are endangered. And his, his plan was he wanted to have a, a model of this, and he wanted to put it in a study area, and then he wanted to film how the predators go after it. Um, he only had one specimen, though, and was preserved in alcohol. And so he needed to you know, figure out how could, he, how could he make all these models. And he wanted to be as accurate as possible. And so, um, you probably heard a little earlier, there was an app a while ago called 123D Catch that used photogrammetry, um, taking images of something and then converting it into a model. Um, that's what Gabriel used. 
turn on the video here. And so he came to the library, and you know he's a poor undergrad. He didn't have the funds to do something expensive, but for just a few dollars, he could print out this model. What he discovered was that the model, being out of plastic, was too hard to record the predator bite marks. And so he ended up taking the model, turning it into a mold, and then um, creating lots of different you know, baby um, tortoises out of plaster. And then he painted them, and he scented them, and he buried them. And this is a study area um, down near the Cape. So apparently he fooled a lot of the predators. We have a, a raccoon come by. He ended up winning an award for this research. Um, he went down to Disney and presented at something. He also had a night camera. I don't know if that's a, these are raccoons. And so this, would, this is research that would have been very difficult to do without having 3D scanning and 3D modeling and printing. But they're trying to get at it. In a second, we have a bear. I like to, it's a possum. I think one of these, the predators actually does get the, oh, there it is. Oh, and there's the bear. And then he was able to retrieve it and look at the bite marks. And yep, it's buried. So these are the kind of projects that we get really excited about in the library. You know, seeing, seeing students enabled to, to create these, you know, the prosthetics and do their research that they wouldn't be able to do otherwise. And there it is on the printer. OK, so now that I've inspired you, um, how do you 3D print? So the first thing you have to do is you have to have a 3D model. You know, and you've already heard a couple hours now how you can scan in an actual object and create a, a model. So that's one of the ways. But there's also websites that you can download um, 3D models that are free to use. Um, we mentioned the Smithsonian website, and I'll talk about a few others in a second. And then the third way is that you can, you can make your own model using modeling software. Um, but first, this should look familiar, talk about um, file formats. Now, for 3D files, there's all different types of formats. Um, for 3D printing, an STL file, that's the most common. Um, some, there's different, um, different words people say for STL. Stereolithographic is, is one. Um, it's a grid, and the grid is made up of triangles that hopefully are not missing. And so this is one of the things I want to point out, is that if you have a, a model file that has errors in your grid where you're missing triangles, that basically renders it, un you can't print it. It's unprintable. Um, say it's, a, um, it's not manifold, it's not watertight. So it's the concept that for 3D printing, what we care about is the surface. We don't care about what's inside the model. It's not a CT scan. Um, so if you think about the model as being an egg, you know, the shell has to, be, has to be whole. It can't have any cracks. It can't have any holes. Um, it needs to be watertight. Um, there is software that you can use to repair models. So if you find a model that you really like, but um, it, it has you know, gaps in the, in the grid. And you, if you're scanning, you're always going to have to clean it up. I mean, you're never going to have a perfect 3D model. Um, but there is, um, so MeshLab was mentioned, a Mesh Mixer by Autodesk, that's another solution. Um, and there's other, other software. Um, but you can put your model in and you can heal it, you can clean it off, and then hopefully you can 3D print it. So for downloading, kind of one of the, the major ones at this point is called Thingiverse, so like universe but with things. Um, there's probably over a million models there at this point. And hopefully there's instructions and there's photos. Um, if, if, say, you download a model and you print it out, you have the ability to upload your photo to it and make comments. You know, this was a good model, this was a bad model. And it's important to look at those because Thingiverse is like Wikipedia, where anyone can, can upload a model. And you don't know if it was someone very skilled 
or my eight-year-old doing it. And you can and you know which one you want to print. And so if you've never printed before, you don't want to select a model that has no actual photographs. And you have to be, look at it really closely because people are, are getting very good at um, creating computer-generated images where it looks realistic, but it's actually not. Um, you want to make sure that someone has printed out before you spend your money and your time and your effort to print out your own version. Um, you Imagine is another one. Um, there's Smithsonian's X3D. There's My Mini Factory. There's a, there's a large number of repositories out there, and there are overlapping models between the two. Um, so you know, if you're looking for something very specific, take a look. Um, but I would start probably with Thingiverse. Um, what you want to do, though, is make sure that the STL file, that's what you download. Um, you can do also OBJs, but STL um, for the 3D printers, that's, that's the easiest. Um, and just remember that if you do find something you like, you can clean it up with Mesh Lab, Mesh, Mesh Mixer, there's actually an online tool. Um, Microsoft has a partnership where they own um, NetFab. And it's a website where it's free. And you upload the model. And it tries to fix it. And then you download it. And it actually does a fairly good job most of the time. You always want to take a look at it to make sure it hasn't just covered up something that's very important. But if you just have a small few, you know, few holes in your, your mesh, it does work fairly well. And it's free. And it's fast. OK, the second one, 3D scanning. You've already heard quite a bit about that. Um, I do want to mention that with the structure scanners that they showed you, we circulate them in Marston. So we have them for checkout, and they are free to use. You take them out of the library for three days. Um, we also, or if you need longer, you come talk to me. Um, we also check out iPads. So you can walk out of the library with a scanning solution right there. You can go there today and get them now. Um, and and scan. We also have a, a 3D um, laser scanner. So we have a Next Engine. The one in Marston right now is down. We're kind of moving it around, trying to find a good spot for it. But the Architecture and Fine Arts Library has one, as does the Health Science Center Library. So um, these are, let's see, it's this picture up there. It's about the size of a cereal box, and it has a turntable, and is attached to a, a workstation. Um, and you can put your object there. And it produces very high resolution um, scans. It does take some work to clean it up. So this isn't you know, a fast scan. You got your model. You know, the structure is fairly fast. Um, the, the next engine is going to take you a bit of time. Um, but those are free to use. You can, they're on walk-up basis, so you don't have to make a reservation. You just go in and ask where the printer or the scanner is, and you can use it for as long as you need to. And so then the third way is that you can create your own model um, using modeling software. Um, there are many different um, kinds of software out there. Our engineers, um, they, they're required to learn SOLIDWORKS. Um, so that's if you're making something that needs to be very precise and geometrical, um, SOLIDWORKS is kind of the engineer's um, choice for software. Tinkercad is. This is free. It's an auto, another Autodesk product. It's web-based. Um, it looks very childish, but it's very easy to learn. And it produces models that do really well in the printer. Um, it's also very fast to use. And so you can even import models into Tinkercad. You can modify them. You can slice things off. And you can export them for printing. You can add text to it, which for a lot of people, that's what they want to do is add you know, words to whatever model they have. Um, and you can export it, and it's ready for printing. So if I need to do something that's very simple, like cutting things off or merging models together, I'll just put it into Tinkercad because it's so fast. Um, and then if we're talking about more organic shapes, we have Blender. Um, there's Maya. There's 3ds Max. So um, definitely software that has a bit of a, a steeper learning curve. Um, but you can produce some really amazing models. Um, I do want to mention that SketchUp it doesn't export models very well for printing, so STLs. Um, maybe some of the new versions have fixed it, but the models that we see coming out of SketchUp, um, they tend to, I don't know, gaps or something about it makes it very difficult to print. So I would just advise using another product. Um, we also have, if you're interested in SOLIDWORKS, 
but you don't want to, to figure out the license. There is a free academic license um, for students, but um, take a look at Onshape. It's, it's a web-based and it's free, um, and it's, it's created by people who used to work at SolidWorks, so it has some of the same capability. Um, but just remember that not all 3D modeling software is designed for 3D printing. That just because you have a 3D representation of a model doesn't mean that it's going to do well on the 3D printer. And you know, it might actually work on one type of 3D printer, you know, think about those different types of technology, but not work on other types. So you have to think about your model and use the technology that is best suited for that. So then what makes a good printable model? Um, this is actually, we had an exhibit recently with um, insects and entomology has been CT scanning some of their specimens and then printing them out. And so obviously the dragonfly is not an actual replica, but these other ones are, are made from CT scans. So that was also kind of a challenge to print out spiders. So things that you, you're gonna care about. Obviously the design has to be has to be well done. You need to be structurally sound. So say you're, you're printing out a box. We print out lots of boxes. Don't know why. Um, the sides of your boxes have to touch, and they have to touch well. I mean, they have to overlap. They can't just, you know, you're modeling when you just get them to kind of touch a little bit, because when you print them out, if they're not solidly connected, they might not be attached. Um, and of course, you don't want any unintended holes. Um, you think about the appearance, you're gonna care about the scale because this will be a physical object. Uh, make sure that things are proportional. And make sure that the walls are thick enough. So I kind of give a rule of thumb, it needs to be at least one millimeter thick um, if you're using this type of printer. Um, otherwise, there just isn't really enough plastic to, to hold it together. You know, think about this, the limitations of your printers. Um, you're gonna have a size, a maximum size of the plate. So for the printer body play here, it's about four by five, and then about five inches height. So that's the largest model that you can print on that printer. And maybe even with some printers, you don't want to go to the very full extent of the plate because the plate not be fully level. And so if it's tilting slightly, you're, you're okay if your model stays in the center, but if it gets out to the, the edges of the plate, um, some, you can see maybe it doesn't adhere, like you saw the octopus pop off, um, and then you have problems. Um, if you need to print out something that's larger than what your printer allows, then you can slice it up into different, different portions and then later glue it together. And that's a way to get around it. And that's what you saw with the virus. Um, again, make sure that your, your features are at least one millimeter thick. That's kind of a rule of thumb. Um, think about the supports. If you need supports, maybe there's a way that, you know, when you give us a model for printing or you're printing it yourself, in the software you can rotate it and you can decide which way you want it to print. Um, and maybe there's a way that you can print it that you're gonna minimize support material. And so you wanna keep that in mind. Or maybe just by designing it slightly different, you remove the need for support material. Um, because it does take a while to do support material, to remove it. So this is a, a molecule um, that was made by a, a grad student in chemistry. This is what her research is on. She wanted to give a copy to her, her advisor. So, this thing was covered in support material, and it took me about two hours with my pliers and a couple band-aids to get it all out, um, which was doable, and she was happy to do it on her own, um, but it was, it was work. And there's some things that you're gonna print that you're just not gonna be able to get in and actually remove the support material. Um, here's a case. So you might, have, you might recognize this, and we didn't actually even plan it out. You, you saw the digital model of the statue. This is scanned, and so we printed it out, and this was a while ago. Um, this, the print actually isn't very good. Um, but it had lots of support material in it. And later on you can come down and you can look at, it's kind of the waffly material that's hanging, hanging off and actually this, this ridge, there's support material in there. And it's just, it's not gonna be possible to remove. Um, and so there's gonna be some cases where you can't remove it and so you have to think about is that, is this the type of printer that you wanna use for printing out your object? Or maybe you wanna find a printer that has a dissolvable support material. Um, and then you want to think about, is the printer material, is it appropriate for what you're using? Um, do you need it to be waterproof? 
Um, are you going to be putting in your car in Florida in the summer? Um, you know, the, if you think about the form labs, the rosin printers, the models are, they're just gorgeous. You know, they're high resolution and they're lovely. But I saw one at a museum in New York City and, and it, would, it was kind of a 3D printing display and it was out for, and lots of people had, had held them and they were kind of sticky at that point. So like moisture had affected the, the model. And I don't know if it was you know, sticky for another reason, but it just was kind of tacky. Um, and it, I don't have experience with that type of printer, but I suspect there was a way to, to preserve it. Um, some sort of material you could paint over it to keep it from getting like that. But you have to think about, um, you know, look at the material properties of, you know, the filament, for example. You know, I mentioned not just ABS and PLA, but there's also PETG and nylon and um, all different types of material. And the material properties are available online that you can look at, say, their tensile strength and see, if, is that what you need? I'm um, talking about supports that are difficult to remove. Um, this is... I think this is Hubble, a telescope. Um, so this, this material down here, that's support material. that's holding up. And you can see how, how thin the um, well, solar collector is. I'm pretty sure that's what that is. And they're so thin that they're smaller, they're thinner than the actual support material. So one of the things you're going to see is it's possible to print it out, but when you remove that support material, it breaks off the actual model. Um, and so that would be a failure. Also, models can just be too thin. The printer is going to try to print it out no matter, I mean, it doesn't say, oh, you know, I can't print this out. It does its best. Um, we had a request to print out a feather, and you see this, the center is edge on. This was too thin to print. Um, the software thought I could print it out, but it couldn't. And they, of course, wanted to print it upright because they wanted both sides, you know, preserved, but we couldn't do that. And so you have your model. So to get it ready for printing, there is software then that's separate from all the modeling software. There's printer software that takes a 3D model and they prepare it for printing. So we call it a slicer, and it slices it into different, you know, the different layers, and you tell it the thickness. So most of the printers that we have in the library, they're printing at 0.2 millimeters. So it's very, very thin, and that's a single layer. So you can even go down to 0.1 on our printers. Um, of course, you know, the more expensive commercial 3D printers will do even higher resolution. Um, you go from 0.2 to 0.1, that doubles the print time. And we, so we, we even, at 0.2, have models that will take 36 hours, 40 hours. Um, so doubling it, um, that's a long time. Um, there's free software for controlling the printer. So Cura and Repetier, if you end up um, using one of our, our library 3D printers, and I'll talk about that, Cura would be software that you would download. Um, there's also proprietary software. And if you really get into 3D printing, I just want to put a plug out for Simplify 3D, which is 149 for two licenses, but bar none is the best printer control software out there. Um, we decided it was worth it. So we're on campus. How can you print at the libraries? How many people have printed at the libraries? This is great. OK, well, I'll just go through a few things anyway. Um, so we have 3D services at three of our branch libraries. We actually had four over here in education, but as you know, they're closed right now. Um, so when they reopen, hopefully we'll add them to the, the list. Uh, Marston, we have the, the largest number of printers. Um, so we offer 3D printing. We have our scanner. And we're circulating technology, so out of Marston, next to the French flies. Um, over in AFA, we have a 3D scanner. And then down the Health Science Center, they have several 3D printers, and they have a scanner you can use. So depending where you're on campus, there's an option for you. And the way our service workflow goes is that we have a website, 3dprint.uflib.ufl.edu. Right now we have about 10 colors of filament, including glow in the dark. And you can go to the website, and you can upload the 3D model to the site. And we then look at it. Um, our 3D desk is open from 9 to 4. You're also welcome to come in person, and we can look at the model with you and you know, talk about whether or not it's going to be doable for printing. Um, we slice it, and we then send you a quote. Or if you're in person, we'll, we'll tell you there. Um, if for whatever reason you want it to be a certain size or you want to keep it under a certain dollar amount, you tell us that, and we can resize as necessary. Um, 
our charge is we charge 15 cents a gram, and you can you prepay either with a credit card or a P card. And then it goes in the queue, and when it finishes printing, we pull it off, we send you an email, and you come to the library during our, our business hours, um, and you pick it up at the service desk. So we try to make it as easy as possible and as affordable as possible. So here's some of our printers. Here's our new Fusion 400. This is our, our largest, actually, we just got a slightly larger one, now I think about it. Um, the Fusion 400 is 14 inches by 14 inches by 12 and a half. Now, if you print out something that takes that entire build volume, that is days worth of printing. Um, and it's gonna cost a pretty penny, so we've had one person take advantage of the entire height. Um, we have a slightly smaller Fusion F306 with 12 inches cubed. Um, we did just get an Ultimaker 3 that I think the build plate is slightly smaller, but it's higher, I think it's a 16 inch. Um, so if you want to print out something that's very tall and skinny, um, that would be the way to go. And then we have these printer bot plays that um, we are checking out. And the way that works is we have, oh, between 10 to 15, but they break, so it's hard to say how many we have at a given time. Um, but at some point, hopefully, we have all 15 in circulation. You can check them out for three days. This is free to you. So if you want to get into 3D printing and you don't want to pay anything, this is the solution. Because we're going to give you uh, 250 grams of filament. It's white at this point, but I have a secret for you. We ha do have a box behind the desk where when these spools kind of get down to the point where it's not worth our time with the bigger jobs, we'll take off kind of the, the dregs of this and we'll put it in a box. So if you come and say, you know, do you have some orange filament? We'll get out the box and we'll give you, you know, whatever color you want. Um, they come in these Pelican cases here and wheels. So this is really sturdy. And you wheel it out of the library. I would advise, you know, not printing it in your bedroom next to your bed with the windows closed. You know, make sure you have adequate ventilation at home. Um, but you can print for three days as much as you want. If you run out of filament, you come back to the library and we'll give you more filament. Um, so you can really print whatever you want. Um, you do need to have it tethered to a computer. So unlike, say, our larger printers where you can just put an SD card and it goes you know, by itself, um, you do need to have a laptop connected at all times to run them. Um, just kind of a heads up, if you are doing this, make sure that you don't have the screen saver or your computer go to sleep you know, after an hour or two um, because that's really unfortunate. And it shuts down the printer. And there's no way to recover once it stops. Um, there are a few other options on campus, and then there are online options for 3D printing. So over at Infinity Residence Hall, um, so just actually slightly northeast of us, a few blocks, um, there's the Fab Lab, and they're located on the first floor. And they have, um, they have plastic printers, like the ones that we have in the library. They also have rosin. I don't know if it's a form lapse one or two. Um, but they have one of those, and they also have a powder-based, and that can do multiple colors. So those are good options. Um, if you get into something that you, know, you really want high resolution, um, go visit the Nanoscale Research Facility. That's located on Center Drive. Um, they're very friendly there. It's not quite set up to make it easy where you just walk in and you pay and um, you have to go through um, kind of using chart fields and have it attached to a grant. But they have a polyjet printer. So do you remember the one I was showing where it's spraying out the kind of the liquid dro droplets and curing? Um, that's a polyjet. And um, it can do multiple materials and same model. And so they've been printing out specimens from the Museum of Natural History. Um, and we had some of them on display in Marston recently. Um, but they were CT scans of, say, a lizard. And you could see the inner organs and the, you know, the skeleton inside and the exterior. Um, so really beautiful prints. They also have a CT scanner. Um, and so these are things that you'll need to, to pay a bit for, but they're available to the UF community. And they're, they're really great to work with. Um, there are some other options online, so Shapeways, Sculptio, um, iMaterialize. These are online services that say you want to have something printed out in gold or silver or, or, or plaster or whatever. Um, they have about you know, 20, 25 different types of materials that you can then, um, you know, again, you upload a model, you tell them what you want, and they'll, they'll mail it back to you. So there's a lot of options out there. Okay, is there any questions about 3D printing? Yeah. Material that you use? Um, PLA. I mean, uh, is there, do you think that there's an opportunity to work on the top?
type of the material, it's kind of the input, and for example, what are the characteristic and specification of the material. And so in terms of designing your own filament, is that what you're? Yes. Yes. And there are people definitely developing new, new filaments, mixtures, um, new formulations. You know, with this type, basically, if it can soften at you know, 180 to 280 degrees Celsius, then you, know, you could use it in that type of printer. What type of material is this that you have here? Polylactic acid. Yeah, so it's derived from plant starch. Have you seen any that uh, like has a uh, formula saying to close to concrete? Well, there are concrete three D printers, um, and those are be on large scales. I haven't seen anything that's that's designed for kind of a smaller scale three D printers. I mean, there's there's people who are three D printing houses. So over in um, over in fine arts. They have a, um, a clay 3D printer. Clay. Clay. Yes, where it's, you know, the slip um, this is actually extruding it, and then they fire it. There is, yeah. Um, and there's filament that looks like uh, wood and, and, you know, chrome and... And bronze, uh, right. And so that's another thing they're doing is that they're taking, so even just PLA, and they're mixing it with different additives. Um, so we do have some wood filament still in Marston. That's kind of one of our secret filaments um, from a project that you can ask about um, now that you know. Um, the difficulty with things like that, now wood's not so much, but say bronze. And I've held a bronze 3D print uh, at a conference, and it's, I mean, it feels like bronze. It's very heavy. You can polish it. Um, it tends to destroy your nozzle because of the abrasiveness of the particles coming through. And so you know, it eats up your 3D printer since, you know, we're trying to keep down costs. But, right. But on your own 3D printer, that would be something to try. And it, it is pretty amazing. Um, yeah. Um, if we borrow the printer, it's free. But if we send our file to the shard? Uh, right, right. So, I, I, you know, in essence, um, you know, first of all, these are being subsidized by student technology fees. So at some point, perhaps a free filament runs out. We have a lot of it still. Um, but the 15 cents grams, you know, pays for the wear on the machines and our labor. If we send our file, uh, the file it should be very perfect, or we can ask you if <coughs> our file or design is not very clean, or it needs some filling or editing. So I don't know. You guys do it or? Well, so we um, we are willing to work with you in making the model. Um, it's very time consuming in a lot of cases to go through and, and fix a model for printing. Um, but what we do is when we see something come through that either the person says, you know, is this okay for printing or just, you know, we can tell it's not going to work out. Um, we'll get back to the patron and, you know, we'll kind of show you screenshots. This is why is it working or come in. If things, when things are really bad, we'll say, you know, come in and we'll, we'll talk about this and I'll show you some software. And, you know, if, if we can do it within, you know, 30 minutes, we'll do it together. Otherwise, you know. Sorry, I had that turned off. <laughs> um, and then we'll help you, you'll get through it. We also do teach workshops. Um, we have a workshop coming up in another month or so on a mesh mixer. Do you have uh, your business card table for? I don't, um, but let me show you where you can we'll jump to the web. Yeah, you're seeing that. If you go to the science library, that's where I work. We have a link here to 3D printing. So here's all the information. So we have a guide. And then this is the website I was telling you about. And you can contact us here. Mm -hmm. So you had a question. Um, what is the average like price run? I know it's like the fifteen cents per gram, but mm -hmm. I don't really have an idea or concept of like what actually prints out. Absolutely. Um, so we do have a three dollar minimum. Um, 
Let's see if I can think about. Uh, so I want to say that this was this is about five dollars. Just uh, and this was actually, even though it doesn't look, you know, too much different, perhaps in size, um, this was I think a smidge over twenty because it was covered in a support material. And that's another reason you want to try to minimize your support material because it minimizes cost and time. Any other questions? Yeah. Just one color, or we have uh, multiple color also for one printer. So, for the majority of our printers, they're just a single extruder, and so that would just be a single color. Um, we do now have. We have at least two dual extruders, so they can do two materials at the same time. So you do two colors. Um, we are still playing around with it. So this is, I have, a, I have an example here. This is actually my home printer. Um, but it's a, a frog. I don't know if you can see it well. Two colors, green and pink. Um, so when you're doing a dual color, or it, there's even printers with four extruders, um, using FF style, if you're doing, say, powder-based, you can do almost full color. Um, you have to have a, a model per color. And then they're co-located. And so where the pink is, the green can't be, if that makes sense. And so the way it prints is it's still doing the same you know, layer by layer. But it'll do the pink color first. And then in that same layer, it'll go through and it'll do the green. And it moves up. And it does that over and over again. So your extruder nozzles, they have to be very well calibrated. Because if they're even off just a bit, as the one color goes through, it can you know, knock your model. It can actually you know, push it off the bed or damage the print. Um, and then also, um, they need to be, again, calibrated well enough that the two colors will merge together. So they're not, you know, this, they're in the same space, but they're separate, separate lines. And if you look at this, some of it's fairly well merged, and some of it's kind of separate. Yeah. We were hoping to get this paper-based 3D printer um, where it's sheet of paper and it's full color because it's ink, you know, like from an inkjet printer. Um, and then it, it has a carbon or a diamond blade where it slices the parts and it glues it together like with Elmer's glue and stacks it together and produces what on you know, the websites look like beautiful models. Um, and we, we tried to get one for about two years and they just had distributor problems, and we were never able to get one, and the, the, the money just disappeared. So I'm hoping for another tech fee cycle that I can request it once they're available. But um, there, there are other possibilities out there. Yeah? Do you have, because um, I've 3D printed, and then the power goes out, and then, of course, yeah, 18 yeah. hours in. Um, <laughs> do you have, like, a battery? Like, how do you? Yes, we have an uninter uninter uninterrupted power supply attached to our large printers, because that happened to us too, where we were having a renovation, and electricians came, and they accidentally cut the power to the room, and we lost some jobs. So you have like a battery? We have a UPS. Okay. Yeah. And again, you know, with these types of printers, you, even two hours in, you don't want to lose your model. And so make sure your computer doesn't go to sleep, or it's not on battery powder. Any other questions about 3D? Um, for yeah. two colors, for this object, the two colors are combined or mixed, but how much, for example, if our design is, uh, has a two separate color? For example, this part is green, this part is possible, or it's... So if it's, if it's two vertical colors, that's when you, you need to have the two, the two nozzles, because it's doing layer by layer up. If you can rotate it, so it's two horizontal, like a, like a birthday cake, for example, a layer cake. Um, there actually is a trick, and um, you have to babysit the printer. But when it gets to the point where you want to change the color, you can pause the printer, unload, reload in the new color, and then continue. And we've also done it where we timed it really well, and we snipped off the, the filament, and we just followed it in with a new color. It's not easy, no. Um, but if you really care about it, and you're doing a small model, then it's worth it. Um, there, there is something called the mosaic palette that was on Kickstarter a couple years ago. And it's a device that you'll have multiple colors um, feed into. And then depending on what color your layer is, it'll feed in the right color. Um, I've seen it in action, but we don't have one of those. But again, it's really finicky, and it's a lot of work. 
and you, your model, you have to specify your, you know, so at that point, you have to, to specify the color of that particular part of your model. And so that's added information you have to have. But painting works really well, too. Any other questions? You do a latex print and shrink wrap it over it, too. Yes, have you seen that done? Yeah, we've done it in my classroom. Really? Pretty cool. I'm going to get your name afterwards, because I've seen it in magazines, but I've actually never seen it in person. We do it with photography. Oh. And then they'll make a transfer onto the latex, and then we take the latex and we shrink wrap it around the model. Do you, is that just texture, or can you actually do features as well? Does it preserve? It does fairly well. I mean, if it's not handled too much, I mean, we're, we're creating art with it. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're doing in my creative photography class. So, um, yeah, we, we're experimenting with textures. Um, but, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty cool. Really neat. Is there another comment? Okay. So, drop 3D printing now, and we're going to move into augmented reality which is perhaps the more technically challenging part of this presentation. Let's see if it works out. So how many of you had a chance to download HP Reveal? Great. OK. So if you want to open that up, I'm um, going to talk a bit, uh, start off, you know, give an introduction to augmented reality, um, kind of some uses here at UF. But then we're going to jump into HP Reveal and, and play around with creating uh, your own aura. Okay, so augmented reality. As we discussed earlier, that's when you, you overlay digital media on top of the real world. And so as a user, you're seeing both things in the physical world and whatever digital media that is. And that can be, it can be an image, it can be text, it can be a video, it can be um, sound. It doesn't have to be an actual image. So sound is considered augmented reality as well. Um, this is not, this is different, of course, from virtual reality where VR is that user is transported entirely into the digital world. And so AR is both the real and the digital together. Um, there's different types of augmented reality. Um, I'd never actually, before preparing this presentation, thought about the different categories. But um, there, there are distinct types. Um, Marker-based. This is when there is, say, an image that you know precisely, and your software knows exactly what that image looks like. And when it sees that image, that it then knows to trigger this new digital content. And you know, in terms of software, that's the easiest because you're recognizing something exactly. And you maybe, you know, there's different shading you have to be concerned with, different angles, but that image is the same. Huh. Um, then there's markerless. So this is now more taxing for your software because it's looking for features. It's not looking for an exact replica necessarily. So it's using um, object-based recognition to try to understand, to map out what it's looking at. And when it sees something it recognizes you know, features of, it knows how to, to, to then correlate it with whatever overlay, whatever digital media you want to show in the real world. Um, you can also use this with location-based information. So, so say you have your tablet, you have maybe GPS, enabled or the accelerometer. Um, and so not only does it see something, it, it can figure out what it is, but it's also in the right location to put over that content. Um, superposition. Now this is, this is a very closely related to the marker list, but this is when then digital objects are overlaid, entirely, even entirely obscuring things in the real world. Um, so for example, IKEA now has a virtual catalog app that you can stand in your room and you can put furniture in different places and it makes it look your, like your room you know, is populated with IKEA furniture. Um, and then there's projection based. And I'm not gonna go into this too much, but it's really interesting. Um, this is when you're gonna project a light you know, forming some sort of an interface onto the real world. So say uh, an augmented reality keyboard where the keyboard would be there, and the, the software can, can sense your finger movement. Um, and that's then triggering a response in the software. So when you think about research and teaching, and we talk about here at UF, um, what are uses for AR? 
Um, it's not all entertainment, just like 3D printing isn't all about printing out Yoda heads. Um, talk about several examples that are used in English. Is anyone here from English? Trace? Okay, I'm going to talk about their research because they're doing some really neat things with um, social criticism and augmented reality. Um, it, just as Angelo showed you with the HoloLens, it lets you put digital objects into the real world and manipulate them. Um, that was pretty cool, I thought. And we, oh, and we have HoloLens that you can check out at Marston as well, along with HTC Vive and um, Oculus Rifts. So that's downstairs at Made at UF. Um, it lets you, you can use augmented reality to put information at point of need. So I don't know if you've seen you know, advertisements for the HoloLens where the person's trying to fix their, their sink and they're able to put, say, a YouTube video right next to it, um, and, or even point out, you know, fix this part, fix this part. And so that information is right there. Um, I've heard of factories now where they're using augmented reality to, you know, you're looking at a, a machine to indicate what parts are which. And so that's going to reduce the need for, for training, necessarily, if that information is always there. Um, also, you know, I don't know if it's called Word Lens at this point. Probably Google Translate, I think, absorbed Word Lens. But who, who had a chance to use Google's app where it translates, it superimposes um, the translation of text? So it's, it's really amazing, especially when you're traveling. You can hold your tablet up, and it recognizes the words. And in the same font, so kind of using that superposition, um, it, it translates the language. So you're looking at the sign saying English. Um, I was at the museum in Washington, D.C., and I tried it. They had a sign there from the Berlin Wall, and it was in three different languages. And I did have to tell the software at that point what language it was looking at, but it was able to translate it into three different, you know, out of three different languages. So that's very useful. Um, and then also improving accessibility um, of campus and its services. So a project that Todd and I are working on um, actually uses um, beacons which are little, little tiny devices that send out a unique identifier. Um, and we have a project that's been working on, there's a, a class called um, VR for Social Good. It also includes AR as well. And um, they're always looking for projects in this class. The class has 100 students. Um, and so last semester, they, they helped build an app for us where the idea is that, so if the Cicerone tour goes around campus, and say, you, you know, if English isn't your, your first language or you don't speak English at all, um, or you're, you're hearing impaired, or you know, visually impaired, so you have accessibility issues, that you have your smartphone, and it's on this app, and when you get, say, to the library, it senses you're at the library, and the Cicerones are giving their tour, but the phone is going to give you a translation into, there's 20 different languages at this point, um, or what we're hoping to do is, in terms of augmented reality, is to, you know, say, if you're hearing impaired, you, um, sign language, there's a sign language video that will pop up and translate what the tour guide is saying. Um, also an audio version that you can listen to as it you know, senses where you are. So that's a project that we're working on. <laughs> it's, it's going. Yeah. OK, so moving into, here's a project that um, the Trace, this is a, a research group in the English department that are, are using emerging technologies for, for criticism and for writing. Um, and this is a project done by Madison Jones and Jake Green. And this was for, for ghost bikes. And so ghost bikes, you might have seen some even near campus. Um, when a, a biker is killed in an accident, um, people paint a bike white and they put it at the, the scene of the accident to, you know, to recognize where it happened. Um, but because of various reasons, those bikes um, are removed, sometimes fairly quickly. And so um, they have a project where they are then augmenting, they're putting the, the digital model of a, a ghost bike on the location where that, that accident occurred. Um, and they've done it, I think, both in Gainesville and in Jacksonville. Um, so they use Erasmus for this, or HP Reveal. I'm going to probably say Erasmus for most of it. Um, and so you can actually follow the, the death driver's channel and It'll tell you where to go, and, and you can look at the ghost bikes. Um, SeaWorld. <laughs> SeaWorld was S-E-E. -E. Um, so this is another project out of Trace. Um, Sid Dobrin and um, Melissa Bianchi and Jake Green. This is a, actually a very involved project where, um, if you recall, there was a, a documentary, The Blackfish, 
um, kind of raising awareness of issues um, with marine life at SeaWorld. And they wanted to, so what they did is they created an augmented reality app that if you go to the park, um, they have, there's different signs across the park that are augmented. And so if you have the app, and you, you have to have that specific app, um, otherwise you have no idea it's actually there, um, you can pull it up and you can look at it and it overlays information about maybe what happened there or you know, the, what's going on with the animals or, or different bits of information. Um, and so they did it kind of secretly at the park. They had some park people following them around as they were taking images of the signs. Um, but I think it's a, it's a very well done project. And you can download it. And next time you're at the park, you can, you can look at it. Um, this is now not something at UF, but I just thought this was so cool. Um, the idea of superposition. Um, so people who are dentistry really is taking advantage of merging technologies, especially in, in 3D um, augmented reality and doing lots of 3D printing, 3D modeling. Um, there's a lot of tutorials out there for dentists. Um, so this is a case where a person, the, the dentist is there and they can adjust it real time. So a person's giving feedback on what they want their teeth to look like and the dentist can adjust it and they can see immediately what that's going to look like. And then it can output, output the 3D model and they can turn that into you know, a new set of teeth or overlays or whatever they're called. So I just thought that was really incredible. And I know there's dentists here at UF that are, are doing quite a bit with 3D technology. All right, another local project. Um, Shannon Butts and Madison Jones and Jake Green and Jason Kreider, so you see some of the same names, um, and Kenny Anderson, again, they're, they're out of trace. And this was a grant that was funded by the um, Um, the Bob Graham Center. So last year, they got a grant to create this, and this is creating an eco tour of Payne's Prairie, uh, so the Lachua Trail and the Sweetwater, the New Branch, um, the park that you can walk through. And just like if you're on a tour and you, know, you have a, a digital tour that you can listen to as you walk around, or an audio tour, excuse me, um, this is now an augmented reality tour. So as you're going through on the path, there's different locations, and you know, there's four or five at this point, and you know, they're, they're definitely hoping to reach the, the entire park. But as you go to that, that point, then you can look at whatever is, is featured there, and it's going to give you information about the geology, um, the history of that spot, um, talk about kind of the environment, how, um, how the water flows through. So it gives you, you know, historical information and environmental information. Um, and they're hoping that then you know, the community will, will download this app and participate. So it's right now it's at a GitHub page. I think I'm going to try to make the slides available later on. So if you want to go and explore this site, um, you can. All right, so if you want to get into to building your own AR um, apps, there are different ways to do it. Um, if, you want to, if you know how to program, um, you can make it natively, and you can do it in Unity is kind of preferred, and um, Vuforia is an extension that you can use with Unity to create an AR or VR um, app. So the, you know, the thing with, with augmented reality is that a person who wants to experience it or have it, they have to download the app. And I think right now you know, that is kind of one of the big pitfalls of AR, is that if you don't know that that content exists, unless you have signs everywhere saying you download or our AR you know, app, a person doesn't even know that you know, this room has probably been augmented, and we have no idea at this point. Um, and so you have to get out the word that there's an app involved to download, so you know, a person has to have a smartphone, um, internet enabled. But there's also these services that are web-based that let you create AR content, and so instead of downloading a specific app, the, the viewer has to download that company's app. And then you can follow, just like on Facebook, you follow different channels, follow different creators, and you can see what, you can see their augmentations. So for example, this room, if, say, we all create um, new well, auras, is the word for, that Erasmus uses, 
um, you had to be following me in order to see mine, because if we augment the same chair, you know, which, one, which one does it show? And that's actually an issue sometimes with, um, say, you're in the grocery store. So companies are really into AR because this is a way to push more marketing and more information at you. Um, so who owns that actual physical space? Who gets to augment it? You know, and that's one of the questions that, say, Trace, they're really interested in. Well, they go, SeaWorld, you know, did SeaWorld have the right to keep them out of the park and not augment it? Or, you know, is it kind of fair game for anyone? Uh, I'm not used to microphones. Who owns that? The physical space. The physical space. <laughs> All right. But HP Reveal, Erasmus, they get around that by, you know, the, following these different creators. And so there is Layar and there is Wikitude, um, but, but Erasmus really is, at least in education, is what it looks like to be the most popular at this point. So the way it works, um, I'm going to just stick with Erasma. HP Reveal is kind of a, I think it's a lousy name. Um, the, the service, the software lets you create these auras. And the aura is made up of, you have a trigger image. And so it can be a photograph, it could be, um, it could be a, a, you know, an icon, a logo whatever, but it's an image that's recognizable. And hopefully it has enough detail, you want enough color variation that you think about the software has to be able to recognize it. Um, and then you overlay it with uh, digital content. And that content can either be another image, it can be a text, you can actually um, put a link to a, a website so that when you interact with that trigger image, it causes your, your smartphone to do something, so to pull up a website. You can do um, audio, you can do video, and you can do 3D models. So that kind of ties back into our, our 3D conversation. And then, if a person knows where it is and they're following you, they can focus on the image and it pulls up that overlay. So with 3D models, um, 3D and Erasmus is actually fairly complicated. Um, I was hoping to show you how it works. I do have kind of a demo 3D model. Um, but they make you jump through some hoops to get it in. Images, very easy. Basically, every other overlay is, ex is simple except for 3D models. Um, you have to bundle it as a tar file. And so you have to know how to create a tar file. There's software for that. And then your format, we know we were talking about models being an STL format. It needs to be in a DAE format, um, a digital asset export. So basically, you have your model, but it also has lighting, and it has texture, and it's being exported. And so you have to export it using something called Collada. That's the export format. And you can do that at a Blender. You can do that at a 3ds Max. Or there was another one, Maya. So a lot of your modeling software won't let you export. Um, it's a bit more complicated because they're going to be, Erasmus taking this model and they're putting it you know, in context of the real world. So it needs color. It needs to understand how the lighting affects it. Um, so you need a texture file. And you need a little thumbnail, which is named thumbnail. <laughs> Um, so it does take some work. But it is possible, say you get a structure scanner, you scan it, you can put it into Blender, then you can export it as a DAE file along with the texture, and then you can put it in Erasma. So it is doable. So now let's, let's do the demo part. Let's see if this works. So if you... I'm going to split my screen. So if you want to open up Erasma or HP Reveal, they have some popular auras that you're automatically following. And I actually have a video here. So you hold up your phone. You should see kind of a blinking, blinking circle and hold it over the $20 bill. And then for those of you who don't have it, I'm showing what, what you'd see. So this is a very complicated aura with kind of exploding video ending in a waving flag. God bless America. So you know, if you have a $20 bill in your wallet, you don't have to focus on the screen. You can pull out the dollar bill Oh, you got one back there. I don't think I have a bill that large. Oh. 
<laughs> if you have one. And there's actually a $1 bill that's been augmented as well that you can look at, at now. Um, and that has a different. So you can augment money. I mean, really, any image that has strong enough contrast, enough detail for the, the software to recognize it, you're going to be able to augment it. Now, if, you know, if your bill is kind of torn, kind of crinkly, it's not going to do so well. Let me see if I can. I'll try to connect my phone here. <laughs> then there's sound, obviously. Okay, I'm, I'm mirroring my phone at this point. Does everyone have a chance to see the $20 bill do its thing? Okay, so on your, with the app installed, you're able to create auras um, that you'll be able to view privately. But if you actually want to create something that everyone else can look at, at least do it easily, um, you need to do it off their website. And it's called Erasmus Studio. It's going to give you a lot more options. Um, so I'm going to try to create some auras in front of you. And if you want to find it, um, my username is Serendipity. So it's S-A-R-A-N-N-Dipity, D-I-P-I-T-Y. Um, and so you can click on follow. And let me see if I can. Okay. And now, now you can see my phone. Okay, so I'm going to, I'm using the Android version. I think the iOS works fairly similarly. Might be some slight differences. OK. So they have ones that you can explore. Oh, I highly recommend taking a look at the Back to the Future one. Let's just do that one right now. Because that is pretty, that's an example of a 3D model with sound. And actually looking at the time. We're not going to do Back to the Future, but I highly recommend it. So I'm going to show you briefly how to create a new Aura. When you log in, there's a Discover section. There's Assets. Assets are both your triggers and your overlays. And so I have two images here that I have set are my triggers. And then I can look at my overlays. And remember, overlays can be 3D. They can be sound. They can be another image. I have a GIF here that I downloaded from Giphy. Um, so those are all uploaded. So you can either have them already there, or when you're creating the Aura, it gives you the option to upload at the same time. And then you click on Create New Aura. And so you're going to pick your trigger image, and that's the one that if someone's walking around, or maybe they're looking at a, a pamphlet, and you have an image there. I'm going to do the UF logo. That's everywhere. Um, I did have the ability to say, give it certain GPS coordinates. So if I wanted that, that aura just to work at a certain location, that would be how I, I, would, I would do it. But then no one else would ever be able to use that aura because you'd have to be at that location, which is disappointing sometimes. Um, I can mask out portions. So say I have a very complicated image, and I say there's a bunch of branches, and I, just, I don't want those because I just care about the recognizable part. I can mask that portion of the image. That's another option. But say it's good. Right now, the logo is great. I go to Next. And now I'm going to give it the overlay. When they see that logo, what should happen? And I'm going to do my animated GIF there. OK. And I can resize it. 
I can move it about. Because this is what they're going to see on their screen when it goes across, when it recognizes that logo. And over here, I can have options. So I can say, not only just pull up this, this animated GIF, but I want the user to be able to interact with it. So say I want them to be able to click on that, and I want it to bring up the UF homepage. I can do that. Yeah, you can see that pretty well. So I can say add an action. When overlay is tapped, and there's other options, double tap, faded in, started, finished, you can even give it a time delay. I'm going to add an option, and I'm going to do loader URL. But you can actually add on up to 50 different overlays to make a really complicated aura. But I'm going to do a URL. You have to tell it's an HTTP. So that's, you can actually also tell it to do an email. So all those commands in HTML you can do, um, you can add those in. So I'm going to tell it to go to the home page and save that. Um, I have the ability to preview, but that doesn't help you because you can't actually see my previews. So go to next. I can give it a name. You have logo. I can get a hashtags. So think about Twitter. That way people can find things. So I'm going to say hashtag UFL. Um, right now it's, it's shared. So I think once I save it, it's going to be public. Because you can have private auras and you can have public auras. So public, anyone can see it as long as they're following you. And then I can close it. And actually, it looks like it kept it as private. But since you can see my, we'll just do it on my, my phone so you can see that. OK, so I'm going to say. So there, I recognized it. I could take a picture of it on my smartphone. And I'm going to click on that, that GIF, and it opens up the website. Did that all work? Huh. That took me about five hours to figure out how to do that. <laughs> so um, there are lots of options. I mean, you can see that I could add on sound at the same time. You know, play the fight song as <laughs> the image comes up. and Or, you know, if you're... Another project that um, Trace is doing is they're augmenting tarot cards. And as you, if you look at the image, or actually they're also doing comic books. So um, the League of the, what is it? The League of Extraordinarily Gentlemen. Um, parts that are in different languages, they've augmented it to put the translation over the words. And so um, there's all sorts of things you can do with AR. Not just marketing for, for universities. So my time's up. Um, but do we have any questions about AR, or people have their own projects that they want to talk about? Or I was using it, um, just kind of marketing it to clients for something I used to do, and I think with Erasma, a really big draw of it is that you, if you have a photo and your, your clinic or whoever is out of state, mm -hmm. you change it from your desk where you're at and it'll update to them. So some examples like they wanted to do um, kind of like treasure hunts um, for a museum and after that gets tired after a year so you can update the images to have a new activity. Nice. So it's really neat. I, I love the program. <laughs> Thank you. We used it, I got the horrible job of being a yearbook editor for a high school and I, we started in the red. So we had a ton of yearbooks, old yearbooks. Mm -hmm. So we found some of the people that were in the yearbook and we used Erasmo to record videos and things like that and then we resold the books oh, wow. with the app. Um, and then now we use the app for at the back of the yearbook, because unfortunately I'm still a yearbook editor or advisor, um, we do messages from parents. So those senior ads that are in the back of the yearbook, uh -huh. they can do the year ads, and then they're talking to their kids. So like, it's a, it's a wow. no-brainer sell. <laughs> what, what high school are you with? Fort Pierce Central High School. Oh, that's... Yeah. We're like three and a half hours south of you. That's really neat. I can see why that sells. Oh, yeah. Because uh, moms buy it all the time. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Is there a comment in the back? Any questions? Anything else? All right, well, thank you so much for your participation, and I think it's lunchtime next, right? <laughs>